welcome to That's BS. For this episode, I'm going to do something a bit different uh, from the normal interview or discussion shows. So today I'm going to give you a brief look into a philosophical... Welcome to Plato's Cave. I'm Jordan Myers, and today we are going to take another step towards escaping the cave by actually re-watching or re-listening to an old episode that I am transferring over from my other show, That's BS. So as I said before, um, this show is basically the new start to anything that I'm doing related to philosophy, and that show is continuing to be um, a political show, a show about society, culture, um, a more laid-back discussion show. So this is a, an episode that I had previously done um, on That's BS, but I think it's relevant to this show and its topics, and so I'm going to carry it over. So here it is, and I hope you enjoy this episode. So I want to get some definitions out to begin with. First, we should look at the term... <clears throat> First, we should look at a term I'm sure you're familiar with, free will. I've discussed this term on the podcast before, but it always helps to be clear what we're talking about. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines free will as, quote, the canonical designator for a significant kind of control over one's actions, unquote. Okay, so what does this mean in English? Well, it means that to have free will, we have to be able to control our actions or thoughts by something we ourselves control, not factors external to us or outside our control. People who believe we have this type of free will are called libertarians, and they believe in libertarian free will. Another way to put it is that libertarians believe that we can act in a way that is not totally and wholly determined by factors outside our control. Things like our past, DNA, random chance, radiation from the sun, etc. Actually, there are three main types of libertarians that can disagree on the nuances of this statement, but we can't really dive into that too deeply for right now. For our purposes for this podcast, just think of free will as the idea that there is something in you that can float free of any external constraints, whether determined or random. If this isn't clear enough, another way to view libertarian free will is that if the universe were rewound to before the moment you made a decision, you could have, you would believe, act differently than you did if we hit play again on the universe. If we rewound the universe and all its parts exactly to the moment before you ate a donut, for instance, this time around, when we hit play, you may choose not to eat it. This is possible, libertarians contend, because there is some part of your mind or soul or cognition or something that can float free of determined causes. Okay, this logically brings us to the next term we should define which is determinism. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy defines determinism several ways, but they are all more or less what we're looking for. So here's all three. Here's the first one. Quote, Determinism is, roughly speaking, the idea that every event is necessitated by an antecedent event, or events, and conditions together within the laws of nature. Unquote. Here's the second one. Quote, Determinism. The world is governed by, or is under the sway of, determinism if and only if, given a specified way things are at a time, the way things go thereafter is fixed as a matter of natural law." Unquote. And here's the third. Quote, the roots of a notion of determinism surely lie in a very common philosophical idea. The idea that everything can, in principle, be explained where that everything that is has a sufficient reason for being and being as it is, and not otherwise. Unquote. Okay, so there's a bit of philosophical jargon there, and <laughs> some wordiness. So what does that mean? Well, it basically can be simplified to, for our conversation, the idea that everything that defines who you are, all the ingredients that make you you, and not someone else, are determined by factors that you had no control over. Now, there are some who want to introduce randomness as a whole through which free will can be in introduced, but honestly this has never been compelling to me. If the random radiation from the sun or the spin of an electron in a neuron in your brain 
can be the difference maker in a decision, well, I kind of view that as a deterministic cause, or at least an external one. And by external, I mean external to my subjective idea or experience of what I'm in control of. It's not external to me, but it's external to what I'm aware of. Clearly, that randomness isn't something we're in control of. And so, even though something random doesn't feel like it should be deterministic, or maybe doesn't seem like it should be, I'm going to include random events and causes when I reference determinism. Now, how do determinism and free will relate? Well, most of you are probably assuming that they are incompatible. That is, you know, you might think that if the world is fully determined, then of course free will doesn't make any sense. I'll show my hand here and agree with that intuition. I do think that determinism and free will are incompatible. And since determinism appears to be true, well then free will must therefore be false. But, as any listener of this show may have guessed, there are people who disagree. These people are called compatibilists. They think that free will can exist even if determinism is true. Daniel Dennett is perhaps the best-known uh, compatibilist of our time. But before him was P.F. Strassen, who can be seen in a similar light. Dennett argues that when we say, quote, free will, we don't really mean that our actions were undetermined before they happened, or that we could have done otherwise, in some sense. The game of chess can serve as a pretty good analogy here. So, pretend that you are a knight in a game of chess. Well, there's two senses of free will that you may or may not have. The first is in the libertarian sense, which I suggested before is nonsensical. The analogy here to chess would be if you, as the knight, feel as if you are the one moving one space over and two spaces up, but you're actually just being moved by the hand of the player in the game. The player in the chess game represents a combination of determined and random causes that created who you were in the moment you decided to move the way you did. Dennett's sense of compatibilist free will is freedom in the engineering or political sense of free will. Um, according to the ru rules of the game, the game being chess, you, as the knight, can choose to freely move any combination of one space and then two spaces orthogonally from that, provided there is not a piece of your own chess set there. Dennett thinks that this sense of free will, the engineering or political sense, is what we should really care about, that we are politically free to take whatever job we want or to spend our money in whatever way we choose. But I think this is clearly shifting the goalposts on what free will actually and really is. I think the important core issue of whether we have any choice in what we do or if we are, as Sam Harris puts it in his book, Free Will, marionettes moved by our puppet strings. <clears throat> okay, so when are we getting to P.F. Strassen and moral responsibility? Now, moral responsibility is a tricky subject, though, so I thought the previous learning we did would be helpful going forward. So, again, I'll quote from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy at length. Here it is, quote, When a person performs or fails to perform a morally significant action, we sometimes think that a particular kind of response is warranted. Praise and blame are perhaps the most obvious forms that this reaction may take. For example, one who encounters a car accident may be regarded as worthy of praise for having saved a child from inside the burning car, or, alternatively, one may be regarded as worthy of blame for not having used one's mobile phone to call for help. To regard such agents as worthy of one of these reactions is to regard them as responsible for what they have done or left undone. Thus, to be morally responsible for something, say, an action, is to be worthy of a particular kind of reaction, praise, blame, or something akin to these, for having performed it. This is enough to distinguish concern about this form of responsibility from some others, commonly referred to through use of the terms, quote, responsibility or, quote, responsible. To illustrate, we might say that higher than normal rainfall 
in the spring is responsible for an increase in the amount of vegetation or that it is the judge's responsibility to give instruction to the jury before they begin deliberating. In the first case, we mean to identify a causal connection between the earlier amount of rain and the later increased vegetation. In the second case, we mean to say that when one assumes the role of judge, certain duties or obligations follow. Okay. Unquote. So, I think that does an excellent job of summarizing moral responsibility. To just kind of elaborate on that, again, moral responsibility is not merely being able to track causality, like in the rainfall example, but rather it is the assessment that an agent is deserving of some sort of response for his or her actions. Here's another way to think about it. Say your roommate or sibling is making you toast in the morning, and they leave it sit too long, burning it. Well, the toaster's thermal output is the causal reason why the toast burned, but the toaster isn't actually responsible for its being burned in the same way that your roommate or sibling is responsible for their mistake. This is obviously a low-stakes scenario, but I think you get what I mean. But what about the times when we treat people like we would treat a toaster? and suspend moral responsibility or judgment of them? What about the connection between free will, determinism, and moral responsibility? Enter P. F. Strassen in 1962. In his paper, Strassen introduces two types of people we can consider, the optimist and the pessimist. The optimist about free will is optimistic that even if determinism is true, and everything about us is fully determined by factors outside our control, we can still be morally responsible. The pessimist, however, thinks pessimistically that if determinism is true, then moral responsibility is incompatible with this claim, and so is not valid. Strassen's goal in the paper, Freedom and Resentment, is to reconcile these two perspectives. Here's the spoiler, though. Strassen thinks questions of metaphysical free will are irrelevant to holding people morally responsible. So that means he thinks that determinism and free will aren't actually relevant when we're talking about holding people morally responsible. Strassen says that when we interact with other people, we hold one of two types of attitude with respect to him or her. One type, Strassen coins, is called the reactive attitude which is when we engage others in a way that blames, praises, or treats them as the object of deserved reactions from us. This type of attitude is basically our default mode. If your friend wrongs you, for instance, you'll likely get mad and yell at him, or ask him how he could have done something like that to you. If your son or daughter helps out another child after getting hurt on the playground, you will feel pride and confer these feelings by way of supportive and proud words and actions. You'll even hear parents say, uh, I'm very proud of you for doing that, when their child does a good deed. Strawson says that when we interact with other people, we hold one of two types of attitude with respect to him or her. One type Strawson coins is called the reactive attitude, which is when we engage others in a way that blames, praises, or treats them as an object of deserved reactions from us. This type of attitude is basically our default mode. If your friend wrongs you, for instance, you'll likely get mad at him and yell at him, or ask how he could have done something like that to you. If your son or daughter helps another child after getting hurt on the playground, you will feel pride and confer these feelings by way of supportive and proud words and actions. You'll even hear parents say, I'm very proud of you for doing that, when their child does a good deed. The other view we can hold towards others is called the objective attitude. This is a suspension of the reactive interpersonal attitudes. Taking the objective attitude towards someone entails the suspension of reactions like blame, praise, and the like. It is how we tend to view things like our toaster or vacuum cleaner or car. The funny thing, though, is that everyone has sort of slipped into the reactive attitude when dealing with inanimate objects. But the objective attitude specifically applies when taken towards another individual, another person. In short, the objective attitude deflates someone's status from a person with whom you may have a relationship with in that moment 
to an object to be accounted for or dealt with. This is clearly someone, or perhaps now something, that does not warrant moral responsibility, that does not warrant the reactive attitude. So, at this point, the question has hopefully crossed your mind, when do, can, or even should the objective attitude be taken towards other people? Well, there's not a cohesive and coherent answer among philosophers, as you may have guessed. The philosopher Christine Korsgaard says that we ought not ever take the objective attitude towards someone because treating them as a culpable agent or with the reactive attitude is what is morally required of us. She thinks that it is always and everywhere wrong to deflate someone to an object, which is to say objectify them or take the objective attitude towards them. Other philosophers uh, disagree, like P.F. Strassen's own son, Galen. Galen Strassen is an incompatibilist on moral responsibility. He is also a pessimist in his father's scheme. Uh, Galen sees that the world is fully determined, or random, and then cannot understand how moral responsibility could follow from that. After all, Galen might think, if I'm not responsible for the factors that comprise my very being, how can I be responsible for my actions? The more recent Sam Harris and Jerry Coyne agree with the younger Strassen. They also see determinism as undermining the possibility of moral responsibility. So, where does the elder Strassen fall? How does he reconcile these two groups, the pessimists and the optimists? Well, Strassen says that sometimes we do hold the reactive attitude, and sometimes we do hold the objective attitude. But this is just a descriptive claim. He's just telling us what really we should have already known. For me, at least, the more important question is when is it morally permissible or even obligatory to hold one attitude over the other? Honestly, in my opinion, Strassen falls flat on this question. In his attempt to reconcile the optimist and the pessimist, I think he skirts this very deep and important question. He explicitly states that we simply cannot give up on the reactive attitude altogether, because it is too ingrained in us, and that even if theoretically determinism was true, this would not bear on the practical question of reactivity. But philosophers also understand Strassen to be saying that for someone who is free, holding the reactive attitude towards him is not a descriptive claim about him, but an indication that we do hold the reactive attitude towards that person. Okay, again, that was a bit of jargon, so what does that mean? It means that um, stating someone is free, uh, holding them responsible, and having or holding the the reactive attitude towards him are all part of the same response. Strassen contends that when someone like myself looks for deeper grounds to place moral responsibility on, that I'm over-intellectualizing the issue. Strassen thinks that when people say someone is responsible for their actions, All they're really saying is that they are holding that person responsible. It's not some deeper ontological or metaphysical claim about what constitutes responsibility. It's just simply that they're holding this person responsible right now for what they did. It's like if someone says a piece of cake is delicious. They don't mean that on some metaphysical level this cake is delicious. They just simply mean that right now and right here for them, this cake is uh, delicious. You know, it's not satisfying some sort of metaphysical, necessary, and sufficient conditions for objective deliciousness. They're just saying that it tastes good to them. And Strassen says to demand a deeper explanation than that would be absurdly over-intellectualizing the issue. But, again, honestly, I find this interpretation of Strassen to be a pretty dull and uninformative one. It just states that when someone is free... In a, compati- in a compatibilist sense that we discussed earlier, um, that's the same thing as saying that they warrant our reactive attitudes or that they are morally responsible. But are they? Is it? I don't think it's clear from what P.F. Strassen said. How does he actually contend with his son Galen's point? Sure, I'm free to hit you or not. 
there's nothing stopping me from doing it, unless you duck my punch, but if I do hit you, should you take the reactive or objective attitude towards me? I think that P.F. Strassen's work doesn't really tell us anything about this. Um, and honestly, it probably depends. If I'm hitting you in a boxing ring with boxing gloves on, and you willingly climbed into spar with me, then the reactive attitude, blaming me for hitting you, doesn't make much sense. What if I do hit you, and you didn't consent to it, but I have a brain tumor that's disrupting my emotional regulation? What if I hit you because I just caught you sleeping with my wife or girlfriend? Is that reactive attitude, in the form of an angry and resentful punch, valid? Is your reactive attitude, maybe hating me for punching you, valid if it's in response to my reactive attitude? I think these are all interesting questions, and I'm not sure that P.F. Strassen gives us the tools to deal with them. This episode would be like 40 hours long if I dove into all the different ways that philosophers have answered these questions, but there are a few main answers that are uh, suggested. One is Strassen's, obviously, which is to say that in the previous you know, couple of paragraphs that I've been reading, I'm preposterously over-intellectualizing the issue with these quibbles. Uh, two traditional ways that aren't Strassen to answer these questions are a consequentialist view and a merit-based view of moral responsibility. In brief, consequentialist views permit the reactive or objective attitude when it produces the desired outcomes or good consequences. The merit-based view says that the reactive or objective attitudes are deemed appropriate by meeting or failing to meet certain merits or criteria for responsibility. These views of responsibility could easily be an episode of their own, but I'm going to just kind of table them here for you to think about. Uh, and if there's interest in me going deeper into this, I can definitely and will happily do that in another episode. But for now, to close us out, I want to ask you what you think. When do you hold the reactive attitude, and when do you take the objective attitude towards people? Does the identity of those people change when you take which attitude? Is the objective attitude ever per permissible? Or is the philosopher Christine Korsgaard correct to categorically forbid it? Is P.F. Strassen's view correct? Or is he under-intellectualizing the issue at hand? I'm curious to hear what you think and if you've enjoyed this style of episode. If you did, or if you have thoughts or questions, uh, please leave them in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube or by emailing me at thatsbspodcast at gmail.com. If you learned something that you didn't know by listening to this episode, please consider supporting its creation. I worked very hard to bring this to you, and it's my sincere hope that it brought you value. To help me continue doing this work that I hope you find valuable, and to get extra rewards, go to patreon.com forward slash that's BS. And as always, thank you so much for listening. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode and learned something from it. And if you want to support my work and what I'm doing, you can do so by supporting me on Patreon. You can go um, to patreon.com forward slash Jordan Myers and donate um, on a monthly basis and receive rewards for your donation. Um, again, that's J-O-R-D-A-N-M-Y-E-R-S. And uh, the links will to everything will be in the description below. If you can't monetarily support me, you can support me in other ways by liking this video, uh, commenting on it below, reviewing the show on iTunes, or sharing it with a friend or with your Twitter followers. Um, you can also email me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com and follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers. And if you want, um, you can check out my other show called That's BS. Um, it's a more discussion-based show with me and friends. Uh, I mentioned it at the top of this episode. So um, if you enjoyed this, please consider supporting me on Patreon. And as always, thanks for listening.